And it is my great pleasure to get tonight's reading started by introducing our first reader, nonfiction writer, Christine Stark. Chris is an award-winning writer and visual artist of European and American Indian ancestry. Her work has been published in num numerous periodicals and journals, and she is co-editor of Not For Sale, an international anthology on sexual violence. In collaboration with musician Fred Ho, her poem Mama's Song was released as a, as a CD, which we have available for sale here tonight at Majors and Quinn's table. Her novel Nichols will be published in June of this year. Now, one of the things that I do each year at the beginning of the year is encourage participants in the group to invite their friends to attend the readings throughout the year, not just their own readings, but all the readings. For the first uh, reading for this year's program, Chris encouraged friends to attend by saying that her partner, April, would read from writing about their dog. <laughs> well, a few of her friends showed up that night fully expecting to hear April read, which was sadly not part of the program. <laughs> but perhaps, who knows, April might share some of that work during tonight's reception. Please welcome Christine Stark. Yeah, thank you, Jared. And um, it's really an honor to be here. And I want to thank all the participants, the mentors, uh, and mentees um, as well. And then Jared for the fabulous work that he does, um, really works hard and makes life really uh, good for the rest of us. So just wanted to put that out there as well. Um, and when I sent that email out to my friends, I wrote it and then I thought, I really have to make this outrageous to make sure that no one's going to believe it. And I said that April was going to be up here um, with her guitar. <laughs> and I thought for sure no one will. And yeah, like three people showed up and they're like, why didn't April read? <laughs> and I was, I was embarrassed. Um, so anyway, um, I'm going to read from... Can you hear me fine? OK. I'm going to read from something called uh, Giwe Go Home. Giwe is uh, Ojibwe, or Anishinaabe for Go Home. And I'm going to start six pages into it. So there's just a little bit of information that I want to uh, give to you to give you a little context that uh, you're missing out on. And then as a writer, you know, as I was thinking this afternoon, what do I need to tell them that they're going to miss in the first five pages? And I came up with two things, and then I got a little worried because I was like, wow, five pages and only two things that were important? <laughs> so I just am going to file that away and not worry about it right now. Um, <laughs> so uh, I move a lot. Um, since I was 17 years old, I have moved 25 times in the last 25 years. Um, so anyway, I counted that today when I was walking my dog. Uh, but that's one of the pieces that is, is important to this piece, go home, um, and I, I move uh, continuously. Uh, so that's an important piece for you to know. And then also in 2004, within a three week uh, period of time, uh, someone burned uh, my art show to the ground uh, if you remember that building down on Cedar and 16th, Gustavus Adolphus building, I think that's how you say it. Um, so an arson set the uh, uh, gallery on fire, burned the entire building down. And what had been in there was uh, my pieces, and then we were also having a, a series of um, political talks about colonization, slavery, and sexual violence, particularly against American Indian and African American women. So anyway, uh, that's a kind of another important piece uh, to understand what I'm going to be reading here. So, when I was a child, the wilderness was my home. Well, the house I lived in was something to escape. My mother and I survived my father and his friends' beatings, rapes, and verbal assaults in a variety of wood and plaster structures throughout rural and suburban Minnesota. But we never really had a home, a place of safety and refuge. Oddly enough, I have been obsessed with owning a home since I was 19 years old, one with a yard to grow a garden and sit out in while the sun set. 
I think I was interested in buying a house because once I got away from my father, I realized I could live in a way that I had never known growing up. A house became symbolic of a home, of knowing who I was, belonging somewhere, having roots. I spent my 20s in poverty and the thought of ever owning a home seemed unattainable. Living on the verge of homelessness was my reality and actually becoming homeless was a much more likely event than making payments on a tutor. But in St. Paul, I left poverty by working as a massage therapist at Jute Salon. My dream became a full-blown obsession, as much based on the fear of being out in the streets as it was based on the hopes of belonging somewhere. I decided, even though I couldn't buy a house at that time, I could get one on a contract for deed until I was able to buy it outright. I searched the metropolitan newspapers, found one, and moved into a miniature one-bedroom pea green house in North Minneapolis. The yard was mud. A person could barely stand in the bathroom. There was a white dealer and two matching white pit bulls across the street. But there was a detached garage, no one from another apartment snoring on the floor above me, and the Theoworth Parkway was two blocks away, a good place to run the dog and find the land inside the city. I thought I'd found a home, but I was wrong. My girlfriend and I were splitting apart. The house was minuscule and overpriced by about $40,000. My mother lent me some cash she came into from the sale of her house. I found a realtor and a broker who were willing to work with my abysmal credit and moved one mile south to a slightly larger house with a fenced-in grass yard that I bought for $60,000 less. It was one of the cheapest houses in all of the Twin Cities at the time. It was trashed, smelled like a barn, and had cobwebs the size of my head. A small lake formed in the basement when it rained. Two inches of dust blanketed the woodwork and the tops of the pictures that the previous owners had left on the walls. Even my dog was disgusted by the dust. The first time I pulled down the previous tenant's yellow lace curtains, he jumped on them enthusiastically, but stopped immediately when dust billowed out, causing us both to sneeze repeatedly. He let, them carry, he let me carry them out alone after that. But the house was mine. After 14 years of searching, I'd bought a house in my hometown. I expected I would live there for the rest of my life. The land, city, and people were familiar. There was a writing and art scene that was second only to New York City. And there was cold and lots of snow. For two years, I worked part-time as a massage therapist, cleaned and remodeled the house, accompanied my mother to her chemotherapy treatments, and attended graduate school one and a half hours south of the cities. Then my relationship ended, my dog was almost nabbed one night from the backyard, my art burned, and my mother died. My ho home wasn't safe any longer. I was a mess, devastated, depressed, lonely. The night after my art burned, I had a dream. A blackened, charred man stepped out of the still smoldering carcass of a building on Cedar and 16th. He lurched toward me, a blue light flashing like a siren atop his head, then veered off to the right and disappeared into the crowd. In the dream, I felt like he was looking for me. I feared that as he lunged about, he would see me, accidentally run into me, grab me, drag me down, back into the building from which he'd escaped. But he didn't. He disappeared and I was left with dread, sweating in the dark of my house, fervently wishing an Indian woman would call me. I flicked on all my lights, sat in bed with my cats and dog, electrified by terror. It was one in the morning. The phone rang. It was my friend, Sam, from the art show. She said she had a feeling she should call me. She is Eagle Clan. I told her what happened. She cried and said I'd better get up there right away. Up there was the White Earth Reservation, where Sam lived, healing from years of sexual violence, homelessness, and the negation of being adopted by a Greek family when she was young and then raised as a Greek girl. She didn't even know she was a Nishinaabe until she was 27 years old. I had plans to visit her in a few months after things settled down with my mother's death. I would see an Indian doctor, get my Indian name, and watch TV with Sam until 3 in the morning. But she said to get up there right away, and so I did. The next weekend, my dog and I trundled up Highway 94 over slick black ice roads. Around St. Cloud, it began to snow. A bit farther north, it became a whiteout, and the roads closed down. I kept driving, weaving between the road closed signs posted on the heavy metal gates that the state troopers dragged across the highways. 
I ignored the advice of a Super 8 motel employee who told me to wait it out at her hotel, used the bathroom, and dashed out the front door. I was headed towards something. I was driving away from something. I had to get to Sam's, blizzard or no blizzard. I have Indian ancestry on both sides of my family. However, I was not raised with anything traditional, and my grandmothers rarely talked about being part Indian. They were fearful and unsure. They were ashamed, and they had racist husbands. The most my family would say was, yeah, we're part Cherokee, pass the butter. No one else said much about it. The result was that virtually all ties in my family to being Indian were severed, and no one knew what to do or think about it, so most of us ignored it. Except me. When I was four, living in the woods of northern Minnesota, I wanted to run away and find the Indians. I remember being young, settled into the deep back seats of cars, when Cher's song about the Cherokee would slide out the speakers. If there was no one in the back seat with me, I would silently cry. If there was someone, I would fight back the tears, sadness welling up inside me as deep and as long as Mille Lacs Lake, the enormous waterway that nips Garrison on the lake's north side and runs along an Anishinaabe reservation on the west side. Later, when we moved to a suburb of Minneapolis, I would stand between two bathroom mirrors to catch my profile. What I saw, flat cheeks, round face, and full lips, was startling, and I would turn away quickly as if I had flashed a card in a poker game that I was supposed to keep hidden. I am light-skinned, but nonetheless I had those experiences, that awareness as a child. In my bones, in my DNA, I knew I was different from the other girls in the suburb who cared about things I didn't understand and didn't care about the things I understood. I couldn't see more than 10 feet in front of me. The snow pelted my windshield and clouded my headlights. My dog was seat belted in the jump seat. No one knew where I was. I had no cell phone. I could have gone off the road at any moment. No one was traveling, not even the cops. But the time had come to find out if I could be Indian. I had been hiding those feelings, that profile, that identity all of my life. I'd spent the previous four years arguing with friends over whether I had any right to be Indian. The time had come to find out if there was another reason, beside the abuse, why I was never at home in my skin. I went into the ditch once, but my four-wheel drive pulled me out, so I drove slower and paid closer attention to the drifting mounds of snow on the road. Then the snow slowed to a simmer, and I could see around me. A few dark silhouettes of trees, an occasional silo and mammoth barn against the swirling charcoal gray sky. About 45 minutes from Monoman, where Sam lived, I saw a familiar blue haze flash through the grayness. I caught my breath. It was the same light I'd seen on the charred man in my dream. Sam greeted me at her door, a bowl of buffalo mac in one hand and a pearly blue and green shell, abalone shell in the other. She burned sage and cedar. My dog curled up on one of her blankets, and I relaxed on the couch. Just being in her apartment, the smell of the smudge and the food put me at ease, reminded me of a home I'd never known, but had traveled many roads to find. The next evening, Sam and I headed out for Earl and Kathy's house. Sam is blind in one eye, and I had never been to White Earth. On White Earth, you can drive for hours and never pass a convenience store or a gas station. The only light is from the stars and moon. We took a right instead of a left and became lost on the rural roads, arriving two hours after we told them we would. We had to stop three times asking for Earl and Kathy until finally we found a family who knew them and gave us directions. Earl and Kathy, being on Indian time, didn't seem to mind our tardiness and welcome us into their home in Natawash. Kathy set down black, uh, cups of black coffee while Earl fried up pancakes. Sam had told me to say, bungi, which means a little, when Earl offered me food, or I would have a stack of pancakes as high as the ceiling. <laughs> the four of us sat at their table in the kitchen and ate. I passed Earl some asema, told him I needed help. Sam made conversation about a variety of things unrelated to me and our visit, while I did my best to eat. The fire had set off terror from my childhood, old feelings of being told not to tell, and the subsequent threats that if I did, I would be hurt were on the loose. I couldn't contain them anymore. 
The night before, I'd had a dream that my father and other men were chasing me through the woods. I ran, dodging tree trunks thick as my waist, swiping at undergrowth with my hands. They were just about to grab me when I plunged out of the woods and saw a chasm. I kept running, didn't stop to think, and flew over the chasm, which I knew, at that time in my dream, my father and his men were not allowed to cross. While I was in the air, I turned and I laughed at them. They shot at me, and I landed on the other side, the Indian side, and set off into the woods. The dream had a good ending. It was defiant. I escaped. But it was unsettling, too, as precursors of great change always are. Kathy was quiet, sipping her coffee. Sam talked on. Earl laughed and occasionally said, oh, and aha, in his lilting Anishinaabe accent. I said nothing, hunched in a chair across from Kathy, the refrigerator behind me and the stove with a cast iron frying pan cooling to my left. 14 months of my mother's cancer, the fire, my lifelong feeling of not belonging anywhere, the years of rape and battery, and the stress of the unknown about the ceremony I was about to go through. What would Earl say? What would he do? What would happen in ceremony? I was there to get my Indian name. That's all I knew. At some point, I knew Earl was waiting for me to do something. I imagined thanking each of them individually, and the second I thank Earl, he stood up and said, we're ready. I followed them. One of Sam's skirts pulled up over my ragged jeans through the living room, down a short hall into a bedroom they used for ceremony. Thank you. <laughs>